Hare Krishna Garud Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. So wonderful Thank to you, have you. Thank you, Chaitanya Charanji. Always enjoyable entering into dialogue with you, my friend. Yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, last time we had a very, uh, you could say a sweet discussion about a very potentially volatile topic about understanding Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and what, what is his approach, what is his strategy in presenting the Gita. So I felt we could build on that. Uh, most of the issues we discussed over there, but maybe I'll mention two, three the issue we, I thought we'll discuss is, does the Bhagavad Gita have a secret message? And later there are two questions. So first of all, why is it a secret then? And then how can we come to know about the secret message? So the word guhiya comes several times in the Bhagavad Gita. And as your, your book, you have titled itself as the beloved Lord secret love song. So first of all, uh, how does secrecy, how do we reconcile secrecy with the mood of compassion? No, why should, if the Lord is compassionate and he is giving us the message, why would he want to keep anything secret at all? Maybe we could start with that. Mm. Yes, wonderful. Well, secrecy, uh, Chaitanya Charanji, secrecy really works on two different levels. There's the Lord who keeps something secret about himself from conditioned souls but also it's naturally hidden from us as conditioned souls. Okay. So what there's a, is, okay. The two aspects is one is what he intentionally keeps secret and the other is what he's not keeping secret, but we are unable to access. What naturally remains hidden. Okay. So for example, we could say even the understanding that I am the soul that itself is hidden because, uh, because of our conditionings we identify with our body. So is that what you're referring to as right. an example? That's right. If, if, I'm, if I'm out in the forest at night, it is natural that the tiger would remain hidden because I can't see it. Okay. Hmm. So there are certain things that we're not ready to see because we're still in the dark, so to speak. Okay. Until we get the, like you and I wear glasses. Hmm. Okay. So this could be the Bhakti Velochana, huh? the, the, the Bhakti Velochana. When we put the glasses on of the Bhakti Velochana, hmm. we can see. When I take my glasses off, you're blurry. But when I put them on, I see with clarity. True. Okay. So then maybe we could talk about levels of vision also, because there is the Gita uses, itself uses the word Jnana Chakshu. I think in 15, yes. 15, 11, 15, 10. Yes. And then yes. I think there's an analogous word might be Shastra Chakshu, but there's so there's Jnana yep. Chakshu. And then what you talk about is bak, Prema Chakshu or Bhakti Vilochana. So basically maybe we right. can talk about two levels. So the two levels of, so rather than you maybe you can use the word secret, but the, we could also say the two levels of knowledge that are inaccessible to us. Hmm? And they become accessible. Yes. Hidden, that, hiddenness. I think hiddenness is a good term. Yeah. But wait, let's go back to Krishna. Okay, sure, please. So, so and his secretiveness. Okay, let's. So, one is let's. I think we don't have to go too much into the idea of because of our conditioning, we don't know some things. That's that's perfectly understandable. So, but I don't think that is the kind of knowledge Krishna is saying that uh, that is hidden, because I think uh, the way he uses it, uh, he says guhiya, guhiya tama, and guhiya tara, isn't it? That there is confidential, yes. more confidential, most confidential. So maybe you could, yes. you could you could continue with what Krishna talk refers to as hidden knowledge. So here there are three levels. Where just now you mentioned two. So how do we uh, reconcile that? Okay. 
So let's take the Bhagavad Gita. You were referring to the Bhagavad Gita. Let's talk about the Bhagavad Gita. How does the Bhagavad Gita open? You know, I love presenting Bhagavad Gita to students in the university who've never read it. You know what I show them, Chaitanya Charanji? I show them the opening of the Bible. There, you know, God created the universe. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He created the universes. And it sounds like a scripture, doesn't it? And then the different gospels, they open up with the, you know, the generations that lead up to Jesus and the, you know, the, the coming of Jesus and, and uh, uh, quoting Isaiah. One of them quotes Isaiah to affirm the divinity of Jesus. And then another um, starts waxing with Gnostic wisdom and mystery. And that sounds like a scripture. And then I go to the Quran. And wow, the Shahada, beautiful, sounds like a scripture. You know, praise be to Allah and so on. And, and, and so on. you get to the Bhagavad Gita. What happened on the battlefield? Tears, confusion. Yeah, yeah. In other words, what that it opens up with a bat. How is this sounding like a scripture mm. compared to the other scriptures? Okay. What what is how did these soldiers act on the battlefield, Tritrashtra? Right? Dharmakshetre, mm. Kurukshetre, Samaveta, Yuyut Savaha. Right? So, you know, on the field of Dharma, on the field of Kuru, mm. you know. Assembling together, some of it, uh, desirous to fight. Hmm. You know, and, and, and you know, Mamaka Pandavas Jaiva Kimakuravata Sanjaya. How does this sound like a scripture to you? I mean, it doesn't compare to the others, but you know how why it's a scripture? Hmm. Because it speaks to the heart of the human condition. Hmm. intention with kuru or our conditioned existence is our pure nature dharma this rub between our kuru nature and our dharma nature uh, uh, this is hmm. the rub this is what the gita is all about it speaks directly to the conditioned nature of our human existence it doesn't waste any time. It doesn't talk about the, the universe. And well, I mean, the Bhagavad talks about the universe, and later in the Gita, Krishna talks about the creation or the the, 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 the extension of the universe from his very being and so on. That's fine. But the Gita speaks immediately through the Dhritarashtras, through the, the evil king of Dhritarashtra, through his words. How do we act in a world? of suffering, a world of suffering that typically begins with us, this, the, 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 the conflict between our true nature and our conditioned natures. Therein lies the, the root of suffering. So, okay, so how does the, now the reason I'm going to the first chapter, Chaitanya Charanji, is because it directly corresponds to the 18th chapter. It's the very frame within which the 16 chapters of teachings mm -hmm. exist. It's a frame. Okay. So the frame, how does it begin? Arjuna is finding himself subject to the conflict in the outer world. That then precipitates the conflict within his inner cognitive world, which then precipitates a kind of heart, shattering of the heart in his innermost world. Okay, those three levels. Mm. The outer world's conflict precipitates the inner world, like, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to work out what's going on here. That's the cognitive world. And then Arjuna finally says, oh my God, this is, this is so painful. This is so painful. And he drops, you know, his knees buckle. He drops to the seat in his chariot. 
So could you call this something is beautiful? Huh? Could you call these three levels as something like, say, the one is of course the territorial conflict. The second is more like a ethical conflict. Uh, because he's well, the eth well, the, well, the ethical conflicts on the outer world. Oh, you're calling the outer conflict as ethical conflict. Yeah, the outer world is the is the interactive world. Okay, so that's Arjuna in relation to the warriors on the other side of the battlefield, who are his cousins, his friends, his teachers. He is asked to kill people whom he loves. Oh. So, so even the outer conflict, what you are saying is, in one sense, uh, not the physical conflict. It is basically a conflict with, with respect to his perceptions of the outer world and how he should respond to them. In a That's sense. right. And that, yes, and it is an irresolvable ethical conflict. He realizes that when he tries to work it out with his inner cognitive world, he tries to reason, uh, maybe I should let them kill me. Because I don't want to live in a world without without loving friends. Hmm. Who would want to live in a world without loving friends? Anyway, I mean, no one, no one would. I so um, he says, you know that how can I love live with Rudhir Pradigdan? That if the if the spoils of victory are tainted by the blood of my grandsire and my teacher, what is the point of it? I don't want to live like that. What is the point? That's right. That's right. So, so, so that's the so he's trying to work out whether he should even fight. Maybe I should let them kill me. Maybe I shouldn't kill them. He's trying to. He's he's working out all that stuff in his head, and then finally he just realizes I am. I am so hopeless and helpless, and his heart is shattered. This is the inner innermost world of the heart. So, would you so call this the like outer? Sorry, would you call this like a existential conflict, or what would you call this innermost level? Any word for it? Oh, oh, oh! That's the affective faculty. So the world of the of of the heart is the affective, the seat of feeling, sentience, and and the 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 inner world is cog cognitive, and the outer world is interactive. Yeah, I think we have, we have mentioned these three points. So the word affective, you use it slightly differently from, say, emotional. Because emotions can be from the mind, but what you're talking about is from the innermost core, the heart. Emotions are most, uh, 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 how do you say, most essentially from the heart. E emotion means what moves out from my being. We all begin with the heart. It goes through the mind and then spells out into the actions of the world, in, our, in, the, in the world from us. But say, are all emotions from the heart? Say, for example, yes. if somebody gets infatuated with, say, people get mad about Harry Potter or Star Wars or something like that. So yes. in one sense, it is not even real physically. It is a fantasy world. So, but wherever emotion is involved, that emotion is from the heart. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Feeling. The world of feeling has to do with the heart. Now, whether those feelings are conditioned or whether they're pure, that's another discussion. Hmm. Feelings are absolute, Chaitanya Charanji. If I make you feel badly right now by calling you a frog, which would be an insult, very insulting, I suppose. I, you know, you're nothing but a frog, okay? And whoa, Garuda's just called me a frog. I, I, that makes me feel bad. I mean, I don't understand why he would call me a frog. That's the cognition, the cognitive. Why did he do that? Why did he call me a frog? I, I, I feel badly. Hmm. Maybe he thinks whenever I respond to him that he that I'm croaking, you know, <laughs> like a frog or something like that. You know, you might try to work it out in your head intellectually, but but the only reason you're doing that is because you feel badly. Hmm. At the so, root, sometimes when we, we say that are feeling creatures. We are feeling creatures. No, but sometimes we say that don't carry away by your sentiments. Don't be so emotional. 
so because our emotions can often mislead us but what you are saying is so in way, we often say that reason should be used to restrain emotion uh, so in some ways my understanding was that there are two levels of emotions one is say what comes from the mind which is quite superficial there some i just see some eat, nice eatable and i want to eat it and there is some emotion in that i am attracted to it but that may be very different from say the emotion which i may feel to a, towards a fellow devotee or a family member or something like that and then ultimately that is uh, different from the emotion that we feel toward krishna so you're saying uh, so the emotions that so then what is the role of the mind if all you yeah. Yeah. Forget about the word emotion. Feeling. Okay. Like right now, Chaitanya Charanji, you're feeling. You're you're a feeling creature. You're a feeling being. Okay. Uh, do you feel good right now? Do you feel good? Yes, I'm happy to be with you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So so there's there's some maybe happiness. Maybe you're feeling well. You know. Uh, maybe uh, you're feeling. Um, uh, inspired, as I know you are often with the philosophy and, and discussions and all kinds of interactions with devotees, you feel inspired. Hmm. We, we, can, we enter into a life of bhakti, not because we're intellectually calculating, but it feels right. Hmm. We are sentient beings. Most essentially, the seat of feeling is behind everything. Now, if it comes out in a sort of explosive way or a kind of dramatic way, emotion means it come, moving out. Then yes, maybe sometimes it gets, if I get too emotional with you here, I'll try to check it with my, you know, my, my intelligence, my mm -hmm. buddhi. So, so this is why at the at, at bottom, Arjuna is being moved from the outer world to the inner world, inner cognitive world, and ultimately he's finding out, you know what? I am collapsing. Uh, I am, you know, Arjuna Vashada Yoga, the yoga of Arjuna's despair is the name of the first chapter. Hmm. How is yoga a despair? How is hopelessness a yoga? How is helplessness a yoga? If these things that we can feel so deeply in our beings bring us to devotional realization, bring us to spiritual life, then it's a yoga. Okay. That's nice. So now, I don't wish, I don't wish absolute devastation of your heart. Chaitanya Charanji. I don't wish that for you, okay? But if that should happen, you will be, as a bhakti, you will be moved to take even more shelter of Krishna. Just as Arjuna did. Hmm. So, if, I mean, this is fascinating. So every time I study the Gita, with, discuss the Gita with you, there's so many, uh, how should I put it? Sometimes there's the saying that a light goes on inside the head. Sometimes <laughs> what I say I feel is that so many lights go on in the head. I don't know which light to follow now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I so, so so but 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 just at the all the at just a reaction of all the lights going off for you. On it's it's okay, it's, okay, it's a light. It's a light. On on not on going on. You say light going yeah, off. Yeah, that's right. Lights going on. That's right. Sometimes uh, lights, lights. Uh, how do you say? No, in the proper way, lights going on. Yeah. Um, it, it almost sometimes we use the word off, like the lights are going off on their own, or you know. Yeah, I know that they're, they're that's, acting. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A, that that's a little subtle, but it is better, more indicative to say the lights go on. So many lights are going on with you, and you laugh with delight. Yes. That's a feeling. That's a feeling. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's not that's not that's not the head. That's the heart. And and the emotion was that you burst out laughing. 
Yes. So, so how are you connecting that with? You said that if Arjuna, sometimes Arjuna, even if Arjuna is shattered, still Krishna's message of the Gita revives him, so, or restores. Yes. Him. Hmm. Yes. And the last chapter of the Gita. See, now I want to take those three levels and show how in the 18th chapter, they're finally addressed as the great secret, the greater secret, and the greatest secret of all, respectively. So that's the frame. The beautiful interactive, cognitive, and, uh, and effective. Affective. Mm. Affective. Right. Affective, yeah. Yeah, right. So are there any Sanskrit words for this, Prabhu? Or... Um, mm, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Hridaya, you know, Hridaya. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe, um, uh, of course, Jnana or, or, or uh, 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 yeah, I mean, there, there are different words that could be used. Okay. You know, um, these are my own observations, admittedly. Yeah, sure. But I'm a philosopher. I'm a, li I have a license. Yes, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I got them from Krishna. You know, you, if you study the whole philosophy as a whole, these, these things come to the foreground. So you take the outer world, inner world, and innermost world, world of Arjuna, and then you go to the 18th chapter, you jump to the 18th chapter, which really is a kind of summary of what Krishna was giving Arjuna throughout the whole Gita, but he brings it in to where the first 49 verses of the 18th chapter address Arjuna's outer world conflict. And that is the great secret. The okay. great secret has to do with dharma. Yeah, that's why it talks about doing your Varnashram dharma, and, but do it in the mood of worship. So a karmanatama that's right. church, work in the mood of there worship. There we go. That's right. And, and throughout is analyzing and talking about, uh, he, he doesn't explicitly tell Arjuna to act in the mode of goodness, but the comparative framework itself implies that goodness yes. is good. Goodness is recommended. That's right. So That's right. Yeah. And we could say broadly, dharma means acting in goodness. Like That's exactly. right. Yeah, okay. So that is the level of dharma. That's right. And that, that uh, the secret of dharma is to act out of love, to act from the heart, to act sincerely, to act according to your swadharma, to act, you know, fully as yourself and to act in relation to the divine. So this is, this is the great secret. Okay. Act fully as yourself. So that means from yes. Arjuna's perspective, a, Arjuna is a warrior, is a kshatriya. And he has to fight. So if yes. he, if he, in the name of nonviolence or pacifism, if he thinks that I will just let go and I'll forgive like a brahmana, that won't work. So in that sense, That's right. aligning with, aligning with his uh, his psychophysical nature. So Shreyan Swadharma Vibhuna yes. Paradharma Swanushita Krishna talks about that, isn't it? That yeah, yes. you have to we have to work according to your own nature. Not anyone else's nature. That's right. Mm. That's right. Guna karma vibhagashaha, right? The, the, according to our qualities, our attributes, and and uh, and the way we we uh, our activities. Mm. I always like to, I always like to tell my students that while I was in college, I was a football player. Now they all laugh. They it's, they just know automatically I'm not a, I was never a football player. I mean, do I look like a football Do I, you know, am I buff like a football player? No, I'm, you know, just, uh, you know. And, uh, so the, the psychophysical natures of uh, humans are ideally engaged in such a way that they can offer the fruits of those actions to, to, to the universe, to the divine, to Krishna. Hmm. It's 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 a way for human beings to be in harmony with existence. 
So that's the outer world. So the great secret addresses Arjuna's outer world, just like you said. It is his nature as a kshatriya to engage in war to protect innocent persons. It's his nature. Is it my nature to go to war? No, it never has been. There was plenty of war around when I was a youth, but I didn't go. You know, that was not my nature. Okay. Now, the inner world, a uh, cognitive world of Arjuna, Sorry, those know. problems are addressed by the uh, greater secret. Okay. Verses 50 through 63. Okay. Guru, if I just may pause it a little bit, if it, one minute. You know, so well, well, just here, but the but Chaitanya chart. Notice forty-nine verses are the bottom of the mountain, thirteen, fourteen verses are the middle of the mountain, and eventually we'll get to three at the top. Okay, go on. Okay, yeah. So fifty to sixty-two and sixty-three, and then sixty-four to right. sixty-six. Okay, that's Beautiful. right. So now. I was just thinking that this working according to your Swadharma, uh, in what sense is it a secret? That is it something that is not known to people? Now we could talk about that secret from, from our perspective and we could talk it from, say, Krishna's perspective. Maybe from one, one thought that came to me is that in today's world, people are often pressured to act in ways different from their nature. It may be the pressure of maybe social pressure, family pressure, peer pressure, even media yes. pressure. So That's right. everybody wants to say in India, maybe be a cricketer or a film star, a movie star or something <laughs> like that. So whatever. But that's not the true nature. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And or maybe if they're a little more sober, then they say in India, you know, if you don't become an engineer or a doctor, your life is a failure. So those, <laughs> <laughs> so those are the... That's <laughs> terrible. Yeah. So that's right. That's right. It, it, our true natures remain hidden. Okay. So we'll use the word hidden in the sense of secret. They're hidden because of our conditioned distractions, our conditioned uh, uh, sort of circumstances. So, yes. Hmm. So now this is a secret that uh, the Gita is revealing in a sense. So to Arjuna, so yes. in what sense, because Arjuna was already a Kshatriya, he was acting as a Kshatriya, only in that situation yeah. he was confused. So in what sense is it a right. secret that is, that is revealed by the Gita? So, okay. So the secret was that he needed to, um, uh, he needed to find a way for that outer world situation in which he found himself to be aligned with the true cognitive and true affective dimensions. In other words, the, the, the element of divinity was missing. The element of the true self was missing in his, in the, uh, and the greater secret moves him into that direction uh, with, with the idea of varna and, and dharma and, um, and acting uh, without the fruits of one's uh, actions being enjoyed, but rather uh, you're doing it out of joy. You're acting out of joy. You know, I tell my students, you know, you should be so fortunate to find something in the world that you really love to do. That's so you, the very thing for which you were put here. That's a very fortunate person, a very fortunate person. Too often people find themselves in jobs that they are, you know, I mean, retirement is like, you, they count the days to retirement. Chaitanya Charan, I could already retire now if I wanted to. You see me retiring anywhere? I don't, I'm, not, I'm teaching at two universities. I'm, I, I, I'm, you know, I, if anything, I'm teaching more than I ever did. Mm. When you love what you do, that's dharma. Mm. And of course, you and I know it has to be connected 
to the supreme. So that's the hidden part. That's the part Krishna gives in the great secret. Okay. Krishna also is in our hearts. He remains very quiet. He remains silent. He observes. He witnesses. Hmm. Just like the two birds in the in the tree on the branch, right? Yes. You Upanishadic example. True. The one bird is so True. busy eating the fruit, it doesn't even notice there's another bird. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> So, so yes, yeah, this is the second, this is the, still the first level secret, isn't it? That's right. So, the great so, secret. So the super soul is not really uh, speaking to us at this level. We are just obsessed with the outer world. And if we are fortunate, That's right. then we come to know our nature and work accordingly. Okay. That's right. Makes sense. That's right. Mm. Okay. So, so it remains hidden from us what our true nature is because we're so distracted by the conditioned circumstances in which we find ourselves. Yeah. What is our true nature? What is our true nature? And of course, you know, the, the inner divinity is, is sort of gently prompting us in that direction. So there is a kind of gradual movement to the inner world, which corresponds to the greater secret. Hmm. So, can we also say that there are levels of joy that the first level yes. secret understanding also that brings a certain level of joy in it isn't it absolutely yeah so if you work absolutely. according to our nature i think i i read some books on writing so there was one author he said that if i come to know that i'm going to die by tonight i will type faster throughout the day so, <laughs> so <laughs> he doesn't know about God. Maybe he does not, not read the Bhagavatam or anything like that. Right. He's just but the threat of death. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that I mean, loves it so much. I just want to do it more. So, yeah. so there's a joy in that. But then there may not be any. Inter there is a. You can say there's a connection with our nature. We are well harmonized with our nature, but we are not yet connected with divinity in any way any significant way right hmm. that's right yes bro but then you know the when, uh, the, the epistles yeah. the, the epistles of paul in the yeah. new testament i believe they're 13 i think they're around 13 the epistles of paul are known to be some of the most beautiful beautiful letters ever written and they they are exquisite and um, Paul was, the Apostle Paul, he was very sickly. He was very sickly, and he never knew if he, would, if he was going to die. And not only that, he was also persecuted. He was also house jailed, um, house arrested. And, you know, there, he had all kinds of problems. So when he wrote those letters to his congregations, like the Philippians, or the Corinthians, or the Romans. He wrote those letters as if those were the last. Mm. So it's not just the threat of death, but the, the passion to give them something of the divine before he leaves. Mm. So, so your, your writer... Uh, a friend or, or your uh, that, that book you read, right? He's saying, okay, right with the threat of the deadline, literally the dead line. The deadline, beautiful. Okay. Um, yeah, right. Okay, with the deadline, but it's more than just the deadline. It's about this passion to, to deliver to souls the most precious jewel of existence. Hmm. And for him, that was, you know, Jesus Christ. That's true. So even at this level, when one is aligned with dharma, so Krishna also talks in one sense about uh, that it's not just acting according to your nature, but act in a mood of worship. So it's, it's not That's that right. there is no connection with the divine, but we could say that, so at this level, uh, we are aligned with ourselves and uh, Maybe you can explain the second level, second level of hidden secrets, and we can categorize them or 
Yes, the, share them a little more clearly. Yes, the greater secret. Yeah, the, secret. the greater secret has to do with transcendence. The greater secret has to do with the true self, knowledge or awareness of the true self, the whole self, the whole self, and the divine presence within the self and all around one. So it has to do with the Atman, it has to do with Brahman, and it has to do with um, uh, uh, Paramatman. So in the, in the 15th chapter of the Gita, <clears throat> The 15th chapter talks about the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the kshara purusha, the perishable person. Well, the purusha never perishes, but it, it, in a sense it does when it's covered with so much conditioning. Then there's the akshara purusha, the akshara purusha, right? Which is okay. the liberated person, right? Yes. Okay. So, the liberated person is this greater secret. The kshara purusha is in the conditioned realm, but becomes akshara purusha because of acting according to dharma and it being in harmony with the, the, the uh, with reality, and ultimately moves that true self to realization of the inner presence of divinity. Okay. And Brahman. Brahman is, is mentioned in the Gita here. So the nature of all reality. And these are the ways. The, the, great, the greater secret is to understand how divinity has been embracing us for an eternity. Embracing us from without, embracing us from within, and embracing us from all around us. Okay. Brahman, Paramatman, Vishwarupa, respectively. Vishwarupa, not Bhagwan. Oh, that's the greatest secret of all. Hey, don't jump. Hey, okay. Okay. hey, you're ruining my whole. You're ruining my whole thing here. <laughs> okay. Bhagavan, that's that's the prize. That's the prize. So you're saying no? I'm just trying to understand. So Brahman, Vishwarupa, and Paramatma all are part of the second of the greater secret. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah, it's the embrace. Okay. What, what I call the divine embrace. Yes. Yeah. So Krishna says also there that Ishvara Sarva Bhutana Mridesh Dishtati. I am residing in the hearts of you all beings. I am directing their wanderings. And you yeah, got it. Krishna also talks about surrender at that level also. Tameva Sharanam yes. Sarva Bhava in Bharata. That's right. That he yeah. surrendered to rather his... than using the word surrender, I say take to the one shelter. The one shelter. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so then just going back a little bit, when Krishna is in the 1 to 49, that first section, there also there yes. is some conception of the divine that you should work in a mood of worship to the divine. So karmanatam abhyarcha. So there the focus That's right. is not on the divine. The focus is on more on the work and it is offered to the divine. Whereas here it is more of an embrace of the, the, the divine is, you could say, more the center of one's consciousness, center of one's perception. Yes. You could, you know, Chaitanya Charanji, you could see that the Vishwa Rupa was more involved in the outer world. After all, it is an outer world manifestation. The way the divine presence pierces through this conditioned existence and of course you know whatever is you know exquisite and excellent and powerful in this world is but a spark of the divine right so so the Vishwa rupa so so actually it, it really the 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 great secret would more incorporate the Vishwa rupa and then when you get to the greater secret of transcendence and the true self, the Atman, and then the Paramatman, and then Brahman, that would be, th those would be more characteristic of the greater secret. Mm. So, and all of these embrace us all the time. That's how we exist. That's how we exist. 
Yeah, we are already in the divine embrace. You know, when you're talking about the Parma, we're already being embraced. Yeah. Yeah. It, already. Yeah, that's true. In the 15th chapter, also Krishna reveals about how we are right now also being sustained by the Lord. And then he talks about how I am the light of the fire, I am the digest, I am the light of the sun, then I am the digestive fire. So he's sustaining that's right. now. So that would be the that's that right. would be a correlation with the greater secret or the great secret. Um uh, that would be the um uh the greater secret. Yeah. Greater secret, okay. I mean, again, these are not like super strict categories but they yeah, you know the, it, it, it's fluid it's fluid so you know the, the divine is all around us and then the divine is outermost and then innermost oh okay that way you're putting it right so so maybe these levels are more more as tools for us to understand rather than rigid categories in which we place the bhagavad gita's verses hmm. Right. Okay. Right. But 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 it's an evolution. It, again, why is it called a great secret as compared with a greater secret? The greater secret is because it's more all encompassing. Hmm. Okay. So that's why you have the positive, the comparative, and the superlative. Okay. Now, okay, but now let's go back to the Gita, the 15th chapter. Because in the Gita, we have, after the Kshara Purusha and the Akshara Purusha, we have then the, the, the greater secret when um, the Uttama Purusha, the Uttama Purusha is described, um, which can be translated as the imperishable, you know, uh, I'm sorry, the ultimate who is a person. Uttama Purusha, the ultimate who is a person or the supreme self who pervades all reality. So, so the Uttama Purusha characterizes the divine in the, in the greater secret. And then when you get to the greatest secret of all, you get to the Purushottama. So there's a difference between the Uttama Purusha and the Purushottama. Okay. Uttama Purusha and Purushottama, there's a difference. That's yes. See, Uttama Purusha is, see, Purushottama means the ultimate within divine personhood equals Bhagavan, as in Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So the Uttama Purusha is describing the ultimate as a person and that's the paramatman but the purushottama is different than the uttama purusha i know you haven't heard this anywhere hmm. but i'm giving it an analysis okay yeah, yeah. you know i think you know that. do you realize after after 55 years of reading the Bhagavad Gita, do you realize how many times I've read the Bhagavad Gita? I mean, it's, and you said at the beginning of our talk how so many lights can go off, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, there I go with off again. Yeah, they, they just get, you know, uh, uh, they, they go on, okay? That's a better expression. They go on. How many lights go on? Mm. And... And, you know, it was only until I delved into the Yoga Sutra, which I'm working right now for publication, working on right now for publication, that I returned to chapter 15 to carefully analyze what is going on in the Sanskrit. Hmm. Uttama Purusha, two separate words. One is a positively modifying the other. Now, I don't want to get too grammatical because I'm going to lose... We're going to lose our, our viewers here. If I can. Yeah. Most people point. don't like grammar. No, it's a good point. I'll just in the sharing the screen for the 15th verse with the Sanskrit. 15th chapter, just give me a minute. I'm thinking now, yeah. if you see 15 point, 16, 17, 18, there's definitely a hierarchy in that. And yes, Yoma Meva Asam Mudho, Janati Purushottama, and Uttama Purusha yes. to Anya. If you consider what you're yes. saying is so strikingly true. 
So the Uttama, yes, Uttama Purusha. Uttama is Purusha. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 is, it is the supreme self. It is the ultimate person. Yeah. So Uttama Purusha is right Manya. There. And That's right. so it's interesting. Krishna, there are places where Krishna in one sense refers to himself in the third person. And that is largely That's right. when he's talking about the Paramatma. He's talking about the Paramatma manifestation. Correct. And if you see in the next Correct. verse, what you're saying, um, he says, yes, Aham, Aham is Pratitha Purushottama. Yes, Mat ah. So he there is referring, you go. He's referring to himself as the supreme person. And that same difference yes. we see in 1862 and 66 also. 1862 is also talking about surrender, but it is a surrender in the second person. Surrender to that one reality, Tam Sharanam Gacha. Whereas 1876, yes. 1866 is Sarvadharman Parittaja, Maam Ekam Sharanam Raja. So, right. Okay. But let's go back here. Let's go back to the 15th chapter, which you have up here. Now, there's a difference between Uttama Purusha and Purushottama. They are not saying the same thing. Hmm. It's so exquisite, Chaitanya Charanji, what's being said here. The Uttama Purusha is saying this is the ultimate who is a person referring to the Paramatma, which is the word right there in the same verse. When you go to the next verse, he says, I am, however, yet still another level of this. I am the Purushottama, that is to say, the ultimate of divine personhood. Hmm. The ultimate within the divine person. You see? The ultimate within divine personhood, and that is Bhagavan. Uttama Purusha is not Bhagavan. True. Purushottama is Bhagavan. So coming back to this. Isn't that beautiful? It's, it's very striking. And I knew that Purushottama is Bhagavan, but it did strike me that just uh, Uttama Purusha and Purushottama are two different things. And of course, we yes, can. Yes, think different. of it this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way, Chaitanya Charan, that the, the ultimate, Uttama Purusha says, the ultimate, which is a person. And then Purushottama says, the ultimate within divine personhood. So in other words, the ultimate within that person. So there's, there is the, the ultimate, which is a person, but then there's the ultimate, ultimate within that person. And that is Sri Krishna himself. Mm. So I am Bhagavan. Beautiful. So it's almost like uh, normally many traditions talk about a hierarchy culminating in divinity. But within the Gaudiya yeah. tradition, there is hierarchy within divinity also. And That's right. So this is talking about a hierarchy within divinity. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And that's why the great secret is involved with the Vishwarupa more. And then the greater secret, Brahman, divinity without, and then and Paramatma within. And then the greatest secret of all is the Purushottama. The greater secret is Uttama Purusha. But the greatest secret of all is the Purushottama, the ultimate within the divine personhood. The ultimate of of divine personhood. The ultimate of divine personhood, you know what that means? That means Krishna in Braj Loka. That's beautiful. So the ultimate of Purusha. The ultimate of Purusha. The, the, the previous verse says the ultimate is a person, is a Purusha, is the Purusha. Mm -hmm. But then the ultimate within the Purusha, that's, that's, it's a subtle thing, but it's there. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So now, in one sense, can you also say in terms of their mood, there is a much greater intensity of passion 
or emotion transcendental passion when krishna is calling out or it is it is the purushottama who is referring who, who is speaking as so as the paramatma is also affectionate but as you say the paramatma is somewhat neutral is neutral he says i hate no one i love no one i'm impartial so we could also say that when krishna is uh, uh, when when the gita is uh, leaving arjuna with a with a choice in the deliberate and do as you desire so that is that is the yes, of the yes 1863 Eighteen sixty-three. Eighteen sixty-three. That's yes. right. So it is. It is not exactly indifference, but you could say it's almost like a. Uh, it is like detached education. Now I have given you education, and now it's for you to decide what you want to do. But then sixty-four, sixty-five. Yes. 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 That's right. Okay. So in eighteen sixty-three, yes. Um. The the uh, this is where. you we truly have free will before arjuna did not have free will when he was in a slump a, a person who's drunk for example a drunkard right how much is free will does he or she have none i mean they're they're drugged they're they're completely incapacitated by a drug with arjuna's state of hopelessness utter hopelessness and despair he had no free will he he was so weak as is explained uh, as he confesses in chapter 2 verse 7 right but in in 63 thus for you this knowledge which is a greater secret than the previous secret is made known by me having fully grasped this with nothing overlooked then act as you so choose now because you've got the great secret and the greater secret you now have the will you now can be the architect of your own future but not when you're in a slump then the gunas are going crazy on you mm. in one sense so once yeah yeah in one sense actually we never lose free will entirely it is you can say it that's right a degree even you can say a drunk also has that option whether i should drink more or i should now get out and go <laughs> home so but although an addiction is pretty darn powerful an addiction i'm telling you it, it's it's pretty bad addictions are devastating because they just take over you yeah yes bro that is true i mean uh, of course we there is a limit to how much free will we have but uh, i just feeling that to say that there is no free will might be a little strong statement isn't it because uh, we do have it, 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 it might be but you know when someone has an addiction the meaning of an addiction is that i will use all my energy to nourish that addiction the 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 addiction of, let's say on a drug as strong as cocaine or heroin this is this takes over it's a sickness it's a disease there is no vishuddha tamas <laughs> you know there's no vishuddha tamas there's no <laughs> yeah, such thing exactly. is absolute darkness but there is vishuddha sattva yeah yes so of course you know addictions can be overpowering no doubt about it at the same time what oh my god yeah it's like the addictions do not overpower to the same degree all the time like we say we have urges and then even the urges have surges so yeah. when, the, when the surges are there then it's almost irresistible not almost it's irresistible but the hope for the addict is or even for attached person is in between those surges what can we do so arjuna going back i mean arjuna also you could say that he was overwhelmed but still he had enough free will to recognize that i have to surrender to krishna i can't figure this out myself so if he didn't have that free will also then he wouldn't have been able to surrender also isn't it that's true it's a subtle thing you know there are the urges and then you said um uh the surges, the, uh, surges of the surges 
I would like to add a third one, submerge, okay? And when you're submerged, it's very bad place. It's a very bad place. Um, hmm. Arjuna, after all, had divinity, Sri Krishna Bhagavan, right in front of him. And that, of course, is the third greatest secret of all. Mm. To actually, so uh, the divinity all around us in the uh, Vishwarupa, a great secret. The divinity uh, without, everywhere, Brahman, the divinity within, Paramatman. And then the ultimate of divine personhood standing right in front of us. Right in front of us. And this is where divinity calls us. Mm. And divinity has been calling Arjuna throughout all those 16 chapters. It started in the first chapter, though, when divinity just sat and listened. Do you realize Krishna said hardly one thing? He said maybe a couple of words. That's it. A mm -hmm. couple of words. This is a, a manifestation of his compassion but also his neutrality. Beautiful. This is a God who does not force us to love him. Hmm. This is a God who does not judge. This is a God that does not condemn. This is a God that does not coerce. This is a God of love. And part of love is allowing a beloved to do what they need to do. As painful as that is. Mm. Yeah, so this so even neutrality hearing as Arjuna Krishna is doing, that is also a manifestation of Krishna's love. Yes. It's not, not cold. It's not cold. Uh, it, no one should read the Gita and, and see it as somehow, you know, Krishna has been there for an eternity just watching, you know, the bird on the branch watching the other bird indulge in eating the grapes or fruits, mm. that bird is wishing for a connection that the bird could stop indulging for a moment and connect with the other, the heart of the other bird. Mm. This is divinity. His yeah, desire sorry. is for us to come back to him. Yeah. You know, so I just going back to the earlier point you said that about yeah. The, in the other scriptures, they sound like scripture, but the first chapter doesn't sound so much. But then we could connect it here that I, I don't think in the either in the Bible or the Quran, there is any place where God is hearing from the seeker. It is most That's of the seeker right. is hearing from God. Whether it is Moses getting That's the right. commandments or Muhammad getting the Quran through the through the through Gabriel, or then of course Jesus is a person, That's right. but then Jesus' position is a he's he is not entirely God. He is like on the earth. So people are interacting with him regularly. So, yeah, it's beautiful. Depends on who you ask. Yeah, depends on who you ask about Jesus. But yeah, that's right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, but yes, that's right. Krishna is so gently. He's very gently revealing himself throughout the Gita. It's not until the fourth chapter that he's reminding Arjuna, hey, guess what? I, you know, guess who I am here? I mean. Do you, do you remember who I am? I mean, you know, so he said, and then of course, you know, uh, he said such a profound thing. He gives, I believe that's in the fourth chapter, what, 11th uh, 4, 11, yeah. uh, verse? 4.11, yeah. yes. So, so, you know, yeah, 4.11. So, so he says, however anyone submits themselves to me, I reciprocate. I love them back. I love them. I worship them. Bajam Yaham. I worship them. I love them reciprocally. That's very powerful. Beautiful. Of course, Krishna Das Kaviraj states in the Chaitanya Chartamita that Krishna broke his promise with the Rajagopikas. But anyway, said, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's too esoteric for this discussion. Yes. Yeah. So now... So this, uh, in one sense, this reciprocity and when you're talking about the innermost secret or the greatest yeah. secret, oh. so there actually yes. 
Krishna's heart comes out, isn't it? That he says that I am speaking this for your benefit because you are dear to me. I loved your translation, Ishto yes. Sime Drudamiti. So Drudamiti, I think you translated ah, it. Yeah. You are dearly loved by me. Isn't it? How do you translate yeah, it? You are so I'm much not... loved by me. So yeah. much. You are so much loved by me. And I've been telling you this. And now, no, okay. So Sarvaguyatamam, Sarvaguyatamam, the greatest secret of all. It's more than just a superlative, Chaitanya Charanji. You know grammar pretty well. Okay. So a superlative would be the greatest secret. But that's not emphasis enough. That's not crying out enough. Divinity is yearning. He's desire the greatest secret of all secrets. That's a super superlative. The greatest secret of all. Now, if that were not dramatic enough, you know, Buya Shrinu, imperative case, imperative. Please hear sorry, once again. If you saw it, I've been telling you this. I've been, yeah. Yeah, okay, go, please go ahead. Now, how can there be something more yeah. superlative? And you say that it is beyond superlative. What is the grammar you're saying? I didn't get that part. Yeah, Sarva. so it's sarva aguyatamam. So it's the greatest secret, but what sarva? All. The greatest secret among all secrets, comparatively speaking, it is more secret, it's the greatest secret. It is, it is the most important secret beyond all secrets. Okay, so guhyatamam is being intensified by sarva. So in that sense, it, That's is, right. it, is, it is like a, you could say something about it's super, super little. A super superlative. That's right. It's a superlative of a superlative. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And if that weren't traumatic enough, right? Uh, uh, you know, Bhuja Shrinu. Shrinu is the imperative case. You must hear this. Please hear this. It's a pleading. Bhuja Shrinu, I've already, please hear this once again for a final time. If that weren't enough dr drama, may paramang vachaha, and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, may paramang vachaha, uh, my supreme message, my, my ultimate words here, my ultimate words. And then if that weren't enough drama, hmm. he puts it in an iti clause, quotation marks. It's okay. Sanskrit's way of underlining something. What is hey, underline? How, how does Sanskrit do that? Iti. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's it, it, iti like um uh, um istosi me dritam iti. iti. So okay. the iti underscores. Or or but see Sanskrit doesn't have underlined, bold face, double strike, italics, yes. uh, you know, emojis. You know, <laughs> you know we don't have emojis. In, 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 in Sanskrit. So it you are so much loved by me in quotation marks. It's like a frame. You are so much loved by me. So you're saying iti acts, this, like, a, iti acts it, like an emphasizer. Iti, okay. That's yes. It's it's an emphatic. It 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 uh, it frames that clause. Uh and it's it. And you know, as for, uh, from someone who has translated the Gita and poured over the text for over 55 years now, over 55 years, th trust me, there is not a more dramatic verse in the whole Gita. That's amazing. Yeah. That's of amazing. course. Now let me qualify. Let me qualify that Chaitanya Charanji. I mean, you know, Arjuna's very effusive doxological expressions in the eleventh chapter. Okay, even in the tenth chapter, starting with verse twelve. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful mm. doxologies. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. But coming from Krishna himself, this is the most dramatic, and yet it's a simple. Anushtub, shloka, you know, uh, uh, you know, quatrain, a verse. 
it's 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 not the the elaborate uh, trish tube, you know, uh, eleven syllables per quarter verse. No, it's the typical eight Puranic shloka, right? But within it, he is so powerful and so dramatic. There is none other more dramatic than that. Mm. Yeah, and then so the beautiful. 65th verse and this and finally the 66th verse mm. you know even in this verse ishto sime drudhamiti so drudhamiti it is our emphasis but drudhamiti is also the drudham is also very important it's like earlier yes krishna has told arjuna that you have to be drudha in your practice of bhakti that yes in, in 9 13 14 satatam kirtayanto maam yatantascha drudhavrata the great souls are determined That's to right. practice of bhakti. But here Krishna is telling That's me, right. I am already doing that part. I am determined. So, David is yours. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so. That's right. Good. Very good. That's a good exegesis. Yep. Okay. Tato great stuff. It's beautiful. It's yeah, just beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. You know, Tato Vakshami Te Hitam. So again, Hitam uh-huh. is over there. You know, I am speaking this for your benefit. So, it's a, uh, now, That's right. I never thought of it that way. That this is definitely so. Sixty-five and sixty-six are more. You could say exhortatory. There also the affection is there, but in one sense this is pure affection. How much Krishna is it? pure? Absolutely pure, and it's coming from his heart. And this is this is the real Gita, the song, mm. the song coming from the beloved Lord's heart. To all of us, you know, it, it just you know, calling us. This is the flute manifesting in words. It's the flute song manifesting in his words. Um, yes, and and of course he, you know, he says, uh, yes. Uh, thereupon, now I translate that uh, te um, um, uh, You know, the, thereupon I shall continue declaring this message for you, which I have set forth into motion. And and then of course you know being mindful of me with love offered to me sacrificing for me act out of reverence for me truly you shall come to me you will come to me this I promise you for you are dearly loved by me powerful this Chichen Itchen does it get better than this beautiful is there anything I mean I mean. Th- now, why is this secret? Okay, now let's get back on your theme that you're pounding away at me. Why is this the greatest secret of all? Why, you know, I've had students read through the whole Gita and tell me what is the essence, and they have no idea what it is. They don't get there. It remains secret. I know so many devotees who don't appreciate this pinnacle of the Bhagavad Gita, mm-hmm. this single yeah. highest point to which Krishna refers in chapter 18, verse 72. In his last verse, he asks us to hear the whole teaching with ekagra, you know, with ekagrena, okay, with with, uh, chetasa. So with with thought focused on the single highest point, with attention to the single highest point. What is that single highest point? That single highest point is sarvagoyatamambhuya shrinume paramangvachaha. That is the single highest point. Now, I was also saying, uh, Chaitanya Charanji, that this, I'm not criticizing devotees for not knowing this. It is natural that we should go through the various stages of Kanishta Bhakti to be able to progress to the more Madhyama Bhakti levels. Okay. Uh, And I was saying that I don't go to an elementary school telling the elementary school children that they're all stupid. That's true. No, I mean, that's, it's good to be a good elementary school student so you can progress on to high school. So you can progress, unless you're someone like me, who drops out of high school, but whatever. Um, and then you go on to college. Now, the problem though does remain that when you, if we stay at the elementary school level of education, the Kanishta level, while we should be in high school, that's a problem. If we are teaching other students and we've never progressed beyond the Kanishta level of knowing, of knowledge, 
Hmm. That's a problem. That's a problem. And if a leader in our movement, you know, now, now look, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, again, these are fluid categories, Kanishta Madhima Uttama. We need to be careful that we always, especially as teachers, we must try to move toward Uttama vision and understanding as teachers on the Madhima level. But because I'm a conditioned soul who's trying to make his way up through the Kanishta stage to Madhima, I need to be in the association of sadhus. So that's why I call you up, Chaitanya Charanji. That's why we have these meetings. So I can refine my understanding. I can be corrected when I'm wrong and or when I'm right that I can be appreciated and we can expound on that together. That's where your ecstasy comes in, where you freeze up, okay? That's <laughs> on, the, on the video conference call. But we should never forget what the ultimate principle of bhakti is, which is that there is a divine yearning. And bhakti and the chanting of the Maha Mantra is the return embrace to the way divinity has been embracing us all the while eternally. But we may, not, so chanting for me may be a discipline. It's not a return embrace for me yet, okay? It may be something that's a discipline and disciplines have value. Hmm. But eventually I will be calling out back to Krishna as he has been calling out to us. I will be returning the call. Just like sometimes you write to me on uh, WhatsApp and then I ignore it. Oh, that's Chaitanya Shri. I'm not going to answer him. Okay, that's what we do with Krishna, right? But if I return the message, if I, if I reciprocate with your message on WhatsApp, ah, then there's a connection. We're not always ready. And so that's the hiddenness that's natural in the process of progressing upward in bhakti. Krishna also is very, very eternally and infinitely patient and compassionate and will wait in eternity more if that's what's necessary. So the secret in this context is that Krishna doesn't, like you said, that you don't go into a, a kindergarten class and tell them that they are foolish. So Krishna doesn't really reveal the you could say the depths of his love to somebody who is not yet ready for it. Not ready. Mm. Otherwise, you know, what, what, it, what kind of relationship is it in this world if someone professes their love for them and they don't love them at all? And then they keep, you know, stalking them. Krishna's not a stalker. Okay. He's not a stalker because there always has to be reciprocation. So Krishna is present as the Paramatma, but the Paramatma is not a stalker in the sense that he's not forcing us. A stalker That's is right. also somebody who follows. A stalker is also somebody who who persig, I mean, almost forces at That's right. opportunity. Okay. That's right. Hmm. That's why you know when I was walking along the sidewalk uh, during between classes, and the sidewalks are very you know crowded because all the students and professors are going to classes, right? Hmm. And I happened to be walking right behind two young ladies who were students there, my university. And I heard one of them ask the other, does Mike still love you? And the other one clipped back and said, he better or I'll kill him. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> right. Can you imagine the situation in which Mike found himself? I mean, if he didn't profess his love to her under duress, which, of course, that's not love at all when you're forced he would be killed. And if he was honest and said, I don't love you, and then she's going to kill him. So I think Mike, I think Mike was killed. That's my theory. I think he was. <laughs> oh God. Okay. It, it has to be reciprocal. Love is something that can, even a God cannot force us to love. Mm, and that's the think only thing we have control over. Everything else is controlled by the Lord. 
you know, this the way you are analyzing this also makes sense of the verse which immediately comes after 1866 then krishna says don't speak this to those who are not yet ready the exactly beautiful thank you for mentioning that beautiful uh -huh. okay but then in one sense so when we are trying to like you are you have written the full book the beloved lord secret love song where what is what is the innermost secret greatest secret say prabhupada has revealed it in his gita uh, so it is that can we say that even if we read the words we will not they will not register in us unless we have evolved to a particular level of receptivity that uh, we may even read the gita but we will find something else uh, right. captivating us more than this the gita you know krishna is eventually saying relinquish relinquish all forms of dharma ekam sharanam vraja come please urgently take to me as your only shelter varnashram dharma is not our shelter That you know true. giving up the fruits of one's activities is not our shelter dying during the the waxing of the moon in the 8th chapter is not our shelter doing ashtanga yoga in the 6th chapter that is not our shelter performing sacrifices of this and that and the other is not our shelter but yet karoshi adashnasi yet jahoshi dadati yet whatever we do hmm. reciprocate reciprocate my love please i'm here desiring you yearning for you gita it's all in the word gita the lord's divine yearnings and supplications to our hearts the beloved lord's secret love song now you know why i have titled it that way it's beautiful bro thank you should i try to summarize for us please we can please you always do it beautifully this is going to be tough but let me try <laughs> oh so, we so we started with discussing about this secret what what is the secret about the gita so we started by how the first and the 18th chapter like the frame and that's why we started with the first chapter and then jumped to the 18th chapter to understand so in the first chapter arjuna has three levels of conflict one is the interpersonal conflict which is the ethical conflict what he should do and how can i kill my relatives and from there there is the cognitive conflict he just can't make sense of it should i just uh, should i just let them kill me what should i do at all yeah. beyond that there is a affective level of conflict and then we had a elaborate discussion about how in the gita we jump to the 18th chapter so verses 1 to 49 are the are the a great secret and that is that we need to work according to our dharma swadharma so it is be yourself so it's a uh, it's not it's secret because many people get caught in by social pressure and other things to do something yeah. to do something different from what they are they are innately inclined towards yes so a few people are fortunate enough to even be in a profession that they are naturally suited for yes and then so at this stage there is some awareness of divinity uh, but the focus is not there and then in the then the next section 50 to 63 is the it could be the paramatma level and to some basically it is where god is neutral at the same time he is uh, he is informing us is this yes. it's it's informing but not uh, you could say uh, not not requesting or Uh, not calling out in that direct sense that happens later and then yeah. we differentiated between the 15th chapter how there is uttama purusha so the 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 ultimate who is a person that is uttam purusha and mm -hmm. then purushottama is the uh, the ultimate within the ultimate person we could say or the ultimate yeah. within the transcendental person so uttama purusha is the paramatma and krishna uses that refers to paramatma in the third person or second mm -hmm. person rather Yeah. whereas when he is referring to himself aham that is in the first person yeah that comes in 1862 and 1866 also so 1863 is where we have free will and it's up to us to choose so love is uh, love means there has to be free will at that level mm, but at krishna doesn't stop 
Krishna is not like a detached teacher. He is, we could say, an impassioned lover. And that, the most dramatic verse is 1864. So it's super superlative. Sarva Goyatamam. Yeah, and, then, right. and then Shrunu, as you said, that's an imperative. Earnestly Shrinu. Asking, Shrinu. Right. request. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Earnestly requesting, please hear. Shrunu me paramam vacha. These are my supreme words. And yeah. then it's just, you can, it's amazing how many intensifiers, are, how many words of affection are there. Ishto sime drudhamiti again. You are dear to me. I'm determined, determined drudham. And then I'll go on speaking to you because of that, as you said. To vakshami tehitam for your benefit. And then we have discussed these two verses, which are more exhortative. So here, Krishna's heart is coming out to us, and he is, he is at one level. You, you know, we had the cyclicity that we had. That started with talking about how the Gita doesn't uh, sound like scripture as compared to say the start of the old start of the Old Testament or even the uh, Quran, no. but. The Gita is not starting with God, it's starting with the human condition. And in that sense, it's it's not about God high up. It's like God with us addressing the human condition. Mm-hmm. And that's why Arjuna is so fortunate that he has the ultimate divinity with him on his chariot. And yeah. so at the start of the Gita, Krishna's love is seen by he hearing Arjuna. That is also his compassion. And then his compassion, you could say, his progresses throughout the Gita with his revelation of more and more about himself. So divinity has been eternally calling out to us. Divinity is calling Arjuna throughout the Gita. But at the conclusion, that call attains its zenith. Yeah. And then discussed about how there are so many things which uh, we might get distracted into while studying the Gita also. And, if you have, and there are different levels which different people will be naturally attracted to. That is also okay for their level. So, but Krishna, he reveals his loving heart for for and for those who are ready to understand it. That is that is supremely enriching. And I think we got a glimpse of that enrichment today through this podcast. So, thank you very much, Guru. You want to add any concluding words? I think you did a beautiful job and um, of summarizing uh, everything. And um, um, just, uh, you know, you should put a warning on uh, the today's uh, podcast that, uh, you know, if they can't, um, if they are not ready for the supreme, you know, secret of yoga, Guhyam Param Yogam, the supreme secret of yoga, which is the start of a Guhyatamam Bhuya, right? The, and, mm. and they should uh, watch another podcast of yours. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks for putting it. Thank you. Very, <laughs> thank you very much, Chaitanya Charan. Wonderful thank to have you. you. I look forward to having you again. Hare. I look forward to it as well. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.